Uh, let me ask you some questions here as we start our time together. Do you ever find yourself just getting tired thinking of all the work that you have to do? You're just sitting around thinking, and you ever make that statement, man, I haven't done anything, just thinking of what I've got to do, I feel so tired. Or do you ever find yourself fatigued on Monday morning, just as tired as you were when you left work on Friday, or maybe even more tired? Do you ever find yourself bringing your work home so you can catch up or maybe even get a little bit ahead? Or do you find yourself ever feeling guilty when you actually start relaxing? You know, you're sitting down, you're relaxing, and you start to feel, oh, I got 101 things I got to do. I got to be doing this. Today, we're going to be talking about what does God have to say about taking time off, about r relaxing. We're in this series looking at the Big Ten, God's Big Ten, called the Ten Commandments and, and everything, and how they apply to us, and how they encourage us, how they challenge us, and how they help us have the families that God wants us to have each and every day uh, within our lives. And, and again, I'll ask you another question. Do you think that workaholism hurts families? It does. And the fourth commandment addresses that, and it talks about taking a day off. And it's interesting, when you look at this fourth commandment, God has more to say about taking a time for rest or taking a day off than he does some other subjects like we think we would, like adultery and murder and so forth and so on. It's actually the longest commandment that we see out of all ten. It's almost like God's saying, look it, there actually is a purpose behind this. There actually is a plan behind this, taking a day off and resting. I created you. I know how you're wired. I know what you need, and this is one of it. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, we start reading this commandment that says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Pretty clear what God thinks about this rest, is it not? The Sabbath is, is an antidote, as we say, you know, for the thing that we call burnout. You know, and we don't go around talking. I mean, we probably all heard the word Sabbath. We maybe even use it. But it's not something we have in everyday language. And a lot of times people, well, what's the Sabbath? Sabbath simply means day of rest. And why does God want us to take a day of rest? Well, Jesus explained that in, in Matthew, what the day is all about. Matthew two twenty seven, when he said this, the Sabbath was made to benefit man and not man to benefit the Sabbath. God says, look it. Stop and remember. Stop and realize. This day is for your benefit. There's a reason that. So you can get emotionally, spiritually, physically recharged because your batteries do wear down. And it keeps you in this fast-paced life from getting burned out. So then the question comes, okay, well then when is it? Because there is an argument. Is it Sunday? You know? I mean, there's many, many religions, but there's three main religions that we have in our world today. The Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. Muslims are legalistic. It is on Friday. Jews, it's Saturday. Christians, we gather together like we are right here on a Sunday. But there's nowhere in the scriptures that says that we are commanded to meet on Sunday. So why are we here on Sunday? Again, if you remember, we've talked about this before and we've learned this, that, you know, one time a year the world sets aside a day and it celebrates the resurrection of Christ. It's called Resurrection Sunday or what the world calls Easter. But back then, the Christians, the very first century Christians, they gathered every week on a Sunday to remember and to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, to celebrate what it's done for them, to remember what they're supposed to do because of that. So every Sunday, if you will allow me, was an Easter back then when it started, and they started worshiping on Sundays, and, and, and they have that. And in Revelation, John calls it the Lord's Day. So we have it that we gather on a Sunday to be. And I realize... I realize as I'm talking about this, you're going to hear me reference, you know, Sunday is the Sabbath. And I understand and I realize that uh, there are people that have jobs today, you know, that jobs that, you know, you got to work, that we need them working. There's the police officers, the firemen, the nurses, the doctors, so forth and so on. I mean, in our culture, <laughs> it's hard to find places that close, that aren't open. I mean, just about everything's open seven days a week, you know, 
every day, you know, and we don't even take off for holidays anymore with it, you know, because of the almighty dollar, and that's a whole other sermon and message to go there. But if you want to be clear about it in, in Colossians, and you can write this down, I'm not going to show you the verse, Colossians 2, 16 to 17, it says, as a Christian, you're no longer tied down by what day you celebrate the Sabbath on. And Paul addresses this in Romans 14 when he says this, starting in verse 5. Every day alike belongs to God, meaning every day is God's day. On questions of this kind, talking about what day do we take to celebrate and stuff like that, one must decide for himself. If you have special days for worshiping the Lord, you are trying to honor him. God says, pick a specific day that's going to work with you with your life and stuff like that and use it for rest, recreation, restoration, and worship. Recharge yourselves. God wants you to do it. And you say, okay, so I've got to have a day every seven days. I've got to have you know, this day of rest, but what should I do? I think that becomes the biggest question. Because God says, keep it holy. Well, what does it mean to be holy? It simply means to be set apart. God's saying, look, you got these six days that you go out, you work, and you do whatever. But on the seventh, this Sabbath, this day of rest, I want it to be set apart. I want it to be different than what you do on these other things. Well, then what do I do? How do I keep it holy? I do it by using it the way that God intended it. How did God intend me to use then the Sabbath? What did he want me to do? Great question. If you're taking notes, here's what he intended when you look through the scriptures for us to do. First of all, he says, I want you to use the Sabbath, this day of rest, to rest your body. You and I need to learn to rest our bodies. The psalmist said in the 127th Psalm, God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. I mean, this is so important to God that he used himself as his example. Remember what we read in the scripture? God created everything we know, the heavens and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Why? Was he tired? No, God doesn't get tired. You know, he was modeling something God says is an extremely important principle in life. Every seventh day, take a day off. I don't know if you know this, but the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled that it is okay for people to have laws that businesses be closed on Sunday. Not, not because of religious grounds, but on the grounds of human beings built into our very fabric, we need periodic rest. Isn't that amazing? Man figured out what God said is good for us, <laughs> and we're doing that. So I don't know if you know this, but I've just given you a biblical reason to take a Sunday afternoon nap. Some of you said, I don't need a reason for Sunday afternoon. I'm taking it anyhow. You know, but you do have a biblical reason. And think about this. It's also interesting to me that there are now more work and time-saving devices that we've ever seen before, and yet people are working harder and longer and are more tired than ever before. There's more stress, more pressure, more what I said at the beginning, that burnout. Inc. Magazine, a business magazine, <clears throat> did a survey several years ago, and in that survey, 62% of people said that in, Ameri in America here that they said, I'm burned out, or I'm on my way to burn out. Kind of reminds me of a couple sayings that I heard, that if you're burning the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. Or you can get so many irons in the fire that you can actually put the fire out. We need to take a day off and a day to rest because we can get consumed by our careers. There's a lot of tempting things that pull us toward our work. More money, more recognition, a better promotion, you know, that, that, that sense of fulfillment, achievement, accomplishment, and all those things. All powerful forces that say work more. And we can become addicted to our work, but our bodies are not built for nonstop work. The writer of Ecclesiastics said this in Ecclesiastics 10.15, Only a fool would wear himself out from work and not be able to find his way. Some translations say way home. Meaning, you are so into work, so tired and so exhausted, you can't even figure out where you live, you know? Whatever we do for a living, we need to stop it one day, you know, in our lives. See, for some reason, we bought into this lie that we think we get more done by keeping on driving, and actually, we kind of throw a kink into the system, and it actually throws us off of kilter. Efficiency experts today say, and have now said, that they have discovered that reasonably spaced rest periods increase productivity over the person who works continually and constantly. Again, isn't that amazing? Man is figuring out and backing up what God says, you know, you need this. And we're finally saying, huh, it really does show when I take this time of rest, this to be there. You know, it's kind of like that old Indian uh, parable that says, you break the bow if it's always bent. 
So the first principle, the first thing you do, you rest your body on the Sabbath. I mean, remember, the most popular psalms, what does it start off? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Has God ever had to force you to lie down? Has he ever made you to lie down? I've discovered that workaholics who never take any days off, never observe this fourth commandment that reminding and learning about here today, they end up observing it whether they want to or not. Sometimes for several days, sometimes for several weeks, and a lot of times in the hospital. You know, they push their body. It's kind of like an accumulated, commun- it's kind of like several Sabbaths put together. Can't even say that word today. But I, a lot of people say, Dave, but it kind of goes back to that, one of those first questions you asked. When I relax, I do feel guilty. I feel guilty for relaxing. Well, guess what? God says, don't. If you do, you're listening to the wrong people. You don't need to feel... I mean, look at the Son of God took a Sabbath. Now think about this. He's here. He knows he's here for such a short time. And and he took a day. There's people that need to know that God loves them. There are people that are dying going to hell. There are people that need to be healed that he could have touched, that he could have said. And he took a day of rest. God took a day of rest. So my friends, who are we if we don't? Maybe you never thought about it this way before, but an unwillingness to take a day off is basically saying, there's so much work to do, and I'm so important, I'm holding the world up. And if I stop, it'll all collapse. Again, I hope God brought you here that maybe if your hearts hear nothing else today, you can hear this. You can resign as general manager of the universe. It will not fall apart if you take a day off. Actually, maybe I haven't thought about this either. A reluctance to rest is actually a sign of immaturity and insecurity on our part. You know, when we are immature, we don't like to rest. You know, I mean, come on, parents. Do kids like to rest? When you were children, did you like to rest? No. You know, you're trying to put your kids to bed at night. What do they do? They argue. They do everything they can to stay up late. Can I have another drink of water? I got to go to the bathroom. Or even after you put them to bed. Mom, Dad, can you? Why? They're trying to stay up. They don't want to go to bed because they're immature. But any wise parent knows that if you don't get the proper rest, you're not going to function well the next day. So you force your child to go to bed to get the rest. And sometimes God will make you lie down in green pastures. And you say, I got to get all this done. And God says, no, you don't. And the best way to do it is listen to what I have to say. Every seventh day, take a rest. But see, that's not all you need. Because there's two kinds of fatigue. There's physical, physical fatigue when your muscles get tired, and then there's spiritual, emotional, you know, when your emotions get tired. And, and today we suffer a lot more from the emotional or spiritual fatigue because there's still the, the manual labor jobs that are out there today, but a lot of the jobs that's coming around and a lot of the job market and the, that are opening up and stuff like that deals more on the emotional side with it. And, and, and you know, people, they can, they'll go home on Friday after work and they can rest all weekend, not do anything, sleep like they never slept, get up, lay on the couch, watch TV, falling asleep off and on, and just rest and rest and rest, and they get up Monday morning for work, and they're still tired, because they've done what they've needed to do for their physical fatigue, but that's not going to take care of the emotional, that's why God says, you need to use it, yes, first of all, to take care of yourself, but secondly, you need to use it to recharge our emotions, to recharge our emotions. And there's some very simple and powerful and fun and beautiful ways to do that. You know, you recharge your emotions in that by just including a time for quietness. Again, that very popular 23rd Psalm. He leads me beside roaring rivers. No, he leads me beside what? Quiet waters. He restored my soul. Quietness and soul restoration go together. And man, are we in a world of noise population, pollution, are we not? It's hard to find a place where you can be totally quiet. Yet, the Bible says, quietness and confidence, that's going to be your strength. The Bible says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. So we need to schedule in those quiet times, those quiet times with God that's there. Many people will use the whole weekend to relax and to recreate, but they never have any quiet And so they're still as stressed out on Monday morning when they wake up as they were Friday when they left work. And Jesus himself, again, he told them in Mark 6, 31, there are so many people coming and going, Jesus said to his disciples, now, 
realize this, okay? I, I want to point this out and make this clear because, you know, I just don't think we understand the importance and the power of what God's trying to teach us. Jesus is surrounded by people. So what do you think should be more important to him? I mean, these people are walking by. If they don't understand and realize who God is, where are they going to go? Not with him forever. And here's Jesus surrounded by a crowd of people. There's constant people around him where he can be the light, where he should constantly be telling people and telling people. And what does he tell them? There were so many people coming and going. Jesus said to his disciples, let's go off by ourselves. By ourselves where we will be alone and you can get rest. Why? Because it's important to do what we need to do to be the salt and light for the people. You know? He says there's so much going on in your life. You need to get alone. You need to be quiet. You need to have that time of quietness in that, you know? Because if you don't come apart from the world, you know, you're going to come apart <laughs> in your life. When I was in school, one of the books I had to read in one of my missionaries' classes, talking about this missionary and the travels that he took, and he was talking about this one specific uh, time they were going through the jungle, and their jungle guide said, we're going to rest today so that our souls have a chance to catch up with us. You ever feel that way? I'm going 100 miles an hour. I just need to stop right now so the rest of me can catch up with me. We need to have those periods. You know, if you want to recharge your emotions, you know, you make time for quietness, but also you need to include time for family. You know, include time for family. In American, in American history, Sunday usually stood for two things, church and family, two awesome things that I think it should be, you know. God wants you to plan some special time with your family to do things. Ecclesiastics 9.9 9 says, enjoy life with your wife whom you love. It also tells us later on that a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. You want to live a lot longer? Chill out. Take a chill pill. Whatever they say. I don't know. Relax. Have some fun with your family. You're not wasting time. You're actually doing the best that you can. And Proverbs 17.22 says, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. See, that's what I love about my WCC family. They understand the importance of family. I mean, that's why we're doing this series on how to make our family stronger because it's important to God that we understand our family. And so it should be important to us. So men, go home, talk with your wife and play with your kids or how I've heard it said before, go home and play with your wife and talk to your kids, whatever. Spend time with your family and that will help recharge your emotions. But a third thing you can do is include time for fellowship time with other believers because we draw strength together Hebrews 10.25 that very popular verse remember let us not give up the habit of meeting together instead let us encourage one another when we come together it encourages one another that's why David said in the 122nd Psalm I was glad I was glad when they said to me let us go to the house of the Lord he looked forward to do you look forward to coming here on Sundays the gathering. He looked forward to it. Why? Because there's rejuvenation that comes by getting together with other believers. You know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I think it can kind of be tough to be a believer in Jesus Christ today in stuff. We need each other to encourage and to uplift each other and to inspire and to challenge each other. We might not always be the best at it, but we need to be working to do that all the time. You know, there's been several times, you know, after Sunday service or later that afternoon or even on the first part of the week, someone will say, you know, you know, David, I wasn't going to come to church Sunday. Had all these other things I was going to do. Had to get caught up on work, whatever, you know. But, but I just decided at the last minute to go ahead and come. And I'm so glad I did because I felt so refreshed, so renewed. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. But if you have, what was happening was you just experienced doing what Christ asked you to do. And because of that, you were blessed by that. You were rejuvenated. You were doing what you were supposed to be doing. The Bible says, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So when we don't do what Hebrews 10.25 says, when we decide to forsake fellowship, not only are we missing the blessing, but we're missing being a blessing to others around. That's how important it is to be there. So we use it to rest ourselves. We use it to, to rejuvenate in that. But also, the last way we use the Sabbath is to refocus our spirit. And I save this one for last because it's the most important. And, that, and I wanted you to remember this as we went out. I wanted you to remember this definitely last point because if we don't get the last point, the other two aren't going to help us. We've got to tune into God. The psalmist said in Psalms 95, 6, Come, let us bow down and worship before the Lord our Maker. You know, Sunday, a day to worship. 
to get a focus on God, a time to remember what's important, a time to get that spiritual tune-up. I have several friend, friends that are pilots. And they, I, I've heard them talk about this before, and I've heard this used in an illustration then, uh, before. They, they talk about in an airplane, there's this thing called a gyro compass. It's an extremely important piece of equipment in the plane because that's what helps keep the plane balanced when they're flying. But pilots also know this thing has to be constantly recalibrated because it gets off. So you have to recorrect it. And that's such a beautiful, beautiful picture you know, for us and reminder because the body and your life has to be recalibrated every seven days. We need to get refocused again on what worship does. It helps bring us into focus what's truly, truly important. You see, the, the tragedy is many people take a day off. They use it to take care of their physical needs. They use it to get their rest and their emotional needs. They have their recreation in their relationships, and they ignore the most important need, their spirit. And their spirit's empty. They'll do the rest. They do the wreck. They're around people, but they come and find themselves completely exhausted Sunday morning or Sunday morning, Monday morning. Why? Because they ignored the most important part of what a Sabbath is supposed to be about. It's empty. Their spirit, it needs to be refilled with God's presence and power and his love and be reminded of that and be reminded of what life should look like. Be reminded about what's most important in life. I've heard it said this way. America has turned Sunday into fun day, you know, We've taken a holy day and turned it into a holiday. You know, hey, it's Miller time. Whew. If you drink Miller, I'm not getting mad at you. That's not what I'm trying to do. You missed the whole point there, <laughs> you know. Most people don't gather to worship God on Sunday anymore. And if the problem is if all we've learned to do is work and play and work and play and work and play, then we've completely lost focus. That's why I believe, you know, what was said in Mark 8.36 is so important for us to remember. What good is it for man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? If all we do is work and play and we gain the whole world, what good is that going to do us? You know? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a question I believe that Christ wants us to ask every seven days. You know, What am I exchanging my life for? What, what did I give the last seven days, the last 168 hours of my life for? He wants us to stop and, and re-examine our priorities, to reevaluate, to regroup, to relax, to tune into God, to listen, to get our perspective right, to get our priorities rebalanced, you know, recalibrated and refocused on God. We need that every seven days. And like I said, I save this refocus my spirit for the last because I think it's the first thing that you ought to do on your day off whether your job allows you to come and be with us and gather with us on a Sunday, or if that's another day, somehow, some way, your time of worship needs to be the first thing that starts off your day before you spend time with that family, before you relax, before you do any of those other things. It's the most important, you know? And we're talking about having a strong family and building up our strong family. You know, what a beautiful thing for us to model for our children and our grandchildren and, and the people around. I mean, and I'll pick on dads. Dads, we're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of our family, you know? It's real simple. My faithfulness, your faithfulness at worship is a good example that you can model to your kids, to your family. I remember growing up, you know, when I was being raised, you know, uh, we'd go out on vacation and stuff like that, and you know, we'd stop someplace, and like if it was a Saturday night, we'd get into the hotel that we were placed, wherever it was we were staying. First thing Dad would do, I'd hear Dad talking to somebody, or be looking up to find where a church was. I'm like, what? We're on vacation. We're supposed to be able to sleep in. What do you mean we're getting up at 7 a.m. to go to Mass? <laughs> you know, and Dad's like, of course we go to, we don't take a vacation from God. What kind of kid? No, he never did that, you know. <laughs> probably wanted to and he probably had the right to many times but you know he is like you don't take a vacation from god you know we go with god and he modeled that for me you know he modeled what that was for me see we need to understand this we don't teach our values to our kids you model them they catch them automatically every time i say well, i'm not going to go to church I'm not going to go to church and worship God this Sunday because we have this hobby or we have this thing or I got to catch up on work or I got to do this. Every time I say that, you know, that we're tired and we got some extra work, whatever, you know, we're modeling inconsistency to our family. God says every seven days, you rest, you recharge, you refocus. Because what's more important, my work or my worship in my life? You know, when, when you purchase a car, every car comes with this, Thing, it's usually in the glove compartment. Anybody tell me what it is? Owner's manual. 
owner manual. It'll tell you about your car, you know, or, or models that look like it, where things are, how to operate it. And, it, and it's got this, this maintenance schedule in there. And it says, you know, at this many miles, if you do this, whether it needs it or not, at this many miles, if you do this, it's got this schedule. And if you keep this up and keep this going, this will help this car operate the way that it will and can keep this car going and lasting for a long time. I think you know where I'm going with this. God says, look it, I've given you an owner's manual. It's called the Bible. And when you read it, and it's got a schedule in there, and one of the schedules is that I say to you, that I give to you, is every seventh day you need to take a rest. And when you start doing it the way that I've asked you to do it, that's when you're going to find and keep going and, and be the way you want. A lot of times people say, Dave, I just can't hear God. Dave, I just don't know. Why isn't God there? Why don't I feel the joy of the Lord being my strength? What's going on? Sometimes one of the questions I ask him, and when was the last time you had a Sabbath? A what? When was the last time you took off and, and, did, and explained to them what I'm talking about here? I don't have time for that. Well, then the joy of the Lord isn't going to be your strength. See, can I, let me just be extremely transparent, gut level honest here with this. God will let you do exactly anything and everything you want to do, but he will not bless it. That's where we've come in American Christianity. And that is American Christianity. You heard me say when we started this off, hey, as long as I enter the waters of baptism, you know, in the Christian church, Church of Christ, this is an important thing, and it is important. As long as I get in there and come up, I'm in. No. No, that's not. That's the beginning of your infancy of your walk with Christ. You haven't reached it. You're just beginning it. You know, and so many times in American Christianity today, we say, hey, I'll do it my way when there's time for God. God says no. And then life shows up. And we get mad at God. Why? You put me right where you wanted me. You stuck me right where you wanted me. You've never had time. I mean, God will be there when we turn to him. That's not what I'm saying. But we get frustrated because I can't hear God or whatever when it comes to these, these times within our life. Well, why? Well, if I'm not obedient to God, you know, yeah, God gives me free will. It's the greatest blessing and sometimes the greatest curse to go and to do. I can do whatever I want. But when I do what God tells me to do, when I live the way that God tells me to live, when I follow God's owner's manual, now there's where the strength, the hope, the joy, the blessing, not the troubles, not that that won't be there, but to get through it and the joy of your Lord to be your strength. The lifestyle that Christ offers isn't a tough lifestyle. He knows you. He created you. He says, I came that you might have life and have it how? Have it to the fullest. That's when the benefit comes, physically, emotionally, spiritually, every way. The worship team is going to come up here and lead us in singing to this God that loves you so much, that knows you better than we know ourselves, that has a purpose and a plan for your life, that wants to bless you. But he says, look at if you're finding yourselves chronically fatigued, and I'm not talking about an illness, but a, a physical ailment, but if you find yourself chronically, emotionally, physically fatigued all the time, then there's a sign that maybe you're out of balance because you're not taking the time the way that God has commanded us to do, you know? That's why he said in Matthew 11, come to me, all who are weary and overburdened, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to encourage you to maybe think about this fourth commandment in a way that you've never, ever thought about it before, or maybe start taking it more seriously in your life than you ever have before, because it's not an option. You know, one way, we're going to pay for it eventually. You know, we do this for your benefit because the Sabbath was made for man. We're going to come out and, and, and the worship team is going to come out and sing. And, and, and as always, we're going to take some time and pray and allow God's spirit to help us to understand these words that we've heard here today. How do they apply to me? What does it look like within my life? Is there a decision I need to make today because of a truth that maybe God's spirit has spoken to me? And we want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. After we get done praying and we're singing, if you're realizing, wow, I, I haven't been keeping this. I haven't been doing this. I've been doing it my way. I want to do God's way. Whatever that is, I'll be up front here. And if there's a decision you want to make, if there are things that you need in your life for wisdom and strength and prayer, and you want the family of God praying with you, come on up here and we will do that. We will do that. But let's go before God right now. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the love that you have for us, that you know us, that you created us. And what a blessing is just to say those words. You created us. You know exactly what it is that we need. Forgive me, Father God. Forgive us all corporately for our arrogance, thinking that we know what is right and what is best. 
Father, when you are Lord, our Master, our Savior, our Dad, knows exactly what's best for us. And I praise you, and we praise you so much for that. I thank you that we could have times like this and gather to set aside and, and just come and be refreshed, that our spirits could be renewed as we remember and we realize how much you love us, how much you care and how willing you are to be there. Forgive us at those times when we turn and do it our way instead of yours, but right now, Father, may your Holy Spirit just help us to see within our life and within our walk any changes we need to make. So we, Father God, are doing and using the Sabbath the way that you would have us, the way that you created it. So, Father God, we can be living for you the way that you've asked us to. Again, I thank you for this time of celebration and this time of rejoicing, this time of being in your presence. Now, hear our hearts as we continue just to sing out and to worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing.